Awake for the Sake of the Future by Rudolf Steiner, Chapter 8. The Human Being and the Spirits of Nature, Implications of an Anthroposophic Worldview. Dornach, January the 20th, 1923. Recently we have been speaking about the relationship of the human being to nature and the entire cosmos in earlier epochs and about the connection humanity has today to the natural world and the cosmos. I have pointed out that in former times human beings experienced nature in a real, concrete and living way because they were able to feel and experience their inner being in a fully enlivened way. For example, I indicated that human beings at one time could experience thinking as if it were a process of extracting salt from their own organism. When a person was thinking, it felt as if a hardening process was taking place within the physical body. It seemed as if one's thoughts were streaming through the body and generating a kind of etheric astral bone structure. A person could also feel the difference between a crystal that was shaped like a cube and one that came to a point. Thus a human being felt inwardly as if thinking were a hardening process. Exercising the will, on the other hand, felt like a fiery process that generated a sensation of warmth streaming through the physical body. Because in earlier epochs human beings experienced so fully their inner being, they also felt inwardly and deeply what occurred in nature and what lived concretely within the natural world. In the present time, we know little about the inner human being than we receive in mirror images of our perceptions from the outer world. We experience these mirror images as if they were memories. We know of these images, what we experience or we experience with our feelings, although our feelings themselves are very abstract. But we no longer experience or receive knowledge in a living manner, a manner that flashes up, rays outward, warms through or illuminates the physical organism from within. Human beings today readily accept what a physician or a scientist tells them about their physicality. A real inner experience of one's own body no longer seems to be available. Since human beings today do not know very much about themselves, except what the scientist or physician has to say, they confine themselves to abstractions about nature and the world. Nevertheless, everything you know about the outer world corresponds exactly to what you recognise and know through the experience of the inner world of the human being. As long as people today are content to know only what a physician or scientist tells them, they can have only an abstract perspective of the world. People today inform themselves about the laws of nature based only upon abstract thoughts, but a living experience of nature is still present at an instinctive level and cannot be denied. Human beings have gradually lost sight of the any mental forces that are at work in nature. A rich realm of nature has been lost to humanity. What used to be understood as the life of nature is now referred to as myths and fairy tales. These myths and fairy tales contain pictures that point to a spirituality that permeates nature. This is an elemental spirituality within uncertain boundaries, but spirituality nonetheless, and one that reveals a still higher spirituality. Humanity in earlier times was not dealing just with plants, stones and animals. Human beings formerly were also in contact with elemental spirits which lived within the earth, water, air and fire. As we have lost our awareness of the inner human being, so too we have lost the living experience of nature spirits. In our time it would not be a good idea to revive a dreamlike consciousness of these nature spirits for that would lead to superstitions. We have to find a different way to relate to nature, one that can be grasped by modern human consciousness. We have to be able to say to ourselves that there was a time when human beings could look deeply within themselves and they had a living capacity to experience what occurred within the depths of their own being. Through this capacity they also became acquainted with elemental spirits. This older way of gaining knowledge out of inner experience spoke to these human beings in pictures which today still affect us with their elemental poetic power. 
But when these people looked within themselves, spirit beings began to whisper and to speak to these human souls. These elemental beings made their home, so to speak, within human organs. One of them would dwell in the human brain, another in the lungs, and yet another in the human heart. In earlier times, you would not have perceived your inner physicality in the way that an anatomist describes it today. Then you would have experienced your physical being as a living elemental spirit being, and the elemental beings who lived in the various human organs could speak thus to the human being. Today, if you were to search a path to these elemental beings by means of initiation science, you would have a certain feeling for these beings, a very particular understanding of them. At an earlier time, these elemental beings could speak through various internal organs to the human being. In fact, they could not move beyond the confines of the human skin. They lived on Earth only in that they lived within human beings. They existed within the human being, spoke to their human hosts and conveyed to them their knowledge. Human beings learned about earth existence in so far as they could learn from the elemental beings who lived within the human skin. When humanity moved toward freedom and independence, these elemental beings lost their dwelling place within human beings on earth. They could no longer embody themselves in human flesh and blood. These elementals still exist in the earthly realm and they still have to reach a certain goal together with humanity. That will be possible only when we express our indebtedness and gratitude to them for what they have given us in the past. At one time these elemental beings bestowed knowledge on humans and then nurtured it. We have them to thank for much that we have become. In our previous lives on earth they were present in us and permeated our earthly existence. Through them we have become what we are now. They no longer have physical eyes or physical ears. In times past they lived within us. That is no longer the case and yet they are still present in the earthly realm. We need to say to them, You were once our teachers, but you have grown old. Now we must give back to you what you once gave to us. We will only be able to do that when we, in our current stage of development, impress nature today with the spirit. We must not just look at nature through the prism of abstract understanding. Instead, we must look more deeply for the pictorial inherent in nature, which is not accessible through dead judgments of knowledge. We must look for what we can reach in the fullness of life and through a feeling imbued knowledge. If we search for the living experience of what elemental beings may bring to us, and this we can activate through the spirit of an anthroposophic perspective, then these beings will come to us again. Elemental beings observe and listen when we deepen our connection to nature through anthroposophic insight and understanding. Then they receive something from us, whereas they receive nothing from conventional physiological and anatomical science. Indeed, they suffer in the face of modern sciences. They get nothing at all from anatomy lecture halls or anatomical dissections, nothing from chemistry and physics laboratories. In these settings, elemental beings have the feeling, is the earth completely empty now? Has it turned into a desert? Isn't there a single human being still alive to whom we now can give what we used to give to human beings? Wouldn't human beings like to bring to us again what they alone can give to the realms of nature? There are elemental beings that are waiting for us to unite ourselves with them, just as we unite ourselves with other human beings and share with them a genuine feeling for the experience of knowledge. Similarly, these elemental beings could participate in our learning about how to deal wisely with nature. When we study physics or chemistry in a conventional way, we cannot receive from the elemental beings what they once generously gave out of their knowledge of nature to us and thus helped to make us who we are. To them we appear ungrateful. Faced with what is currently unfolding in human consciousness, these elemental beings are freezing in the earthly environment. We will be able to express gratitude towards these caring beings when we again search for the spirit in everything that we see with our eyes, hear with our ears, grasp with our hands. For these elemental beings are able to share in the perception and experience of the spiritual element 
that permeates the world of human senses. Whenever we grasp something in a solely materialistic way, elemental beings cannot experience it. They are excluded from this kind of knowledge. We can give to the elemental beings the gratitude that we owe them only when we work together in all earnestness with human beings who share the spirit of an anthroposophic world view. Let us take two examples of observing nature from an anthroposophic perspective. Imagine that you have before you a fish and a bird. At first you look at the fish and likewise the bird with your physical senses. Those who are egotistical in their perception might not bother to go beyond these first sense impressions. But you shall want to overcome and go beyond an egotistical awareness of nature. You may begin by going beyond simply watching the fish in water and the bird in the air. You can consider carefully the form of the fish and the form of the bird and then try to understand how the form of the fish reflects its life and movement in water and how the form of the bird corresponds to its life and movement in the air. We can consider flowing water not just with the understanding of a chemist who looks at the water and says this is a chemical union, two atoms of hydrogen and one of oxygen. Rather, we gaze at water as it actually is in reality. Then we can look carefully at a fish in the water and observe that it has a soft body with remarkable breathing forms towards the front portion of the body. Within the body there is a soft bone structure and a delicate jaw that is produced by the fish's life and movement in water. The bodily substance takes its form as a result of the movement of the fish through water, which is also penetrated by the rays of the sun. If you perceive the rays of the sun entering the water, emanating light and warmth, you can then visualise the fish swimming against streams of light filled and sun warmed water. This will give you a feeling of what the fish experiences swimming against the current of the water that has been softened by the sun's warmth and illuminated by the sun's light. If I imagine that the fish is swimming towards me, I can see that its teeth carry the light and warmth filled streams of water into its bodily substance and connect it to its breathing organs. In a unique way, the form of the head provides an ideal covering for the jaw as the fish swims into the sunlit and light warmed water. Next I feel that something else is active in the tail of the fish. I experience that the flow of water along the tail of the fish contains a much weaker level of light than the water flowing up against the head of the fish. The light filled flow of water around the head of the fish encourages the fish's bodily substance to remain soft. The water around the tail which flows under subdued light produces a tendency towards hardness. Observing both these phenomena, I learn that the head of the fish encounters what is sun-like and that the more rigid tail of the fish has been affected by the moon as it reflects light. Thus I am able to place the fish in the fullness of its connection to water. Next I gaze at the bird, which has not had the opportunity of forming its head by moving and swimming through sunlit and sun-warmed water, but instead is dependent upon the air. I discover the exertion that is required for the bird to breathe. Unlike the fish, the bird's breathing process is not supported by being surrounded by water. The warming and illuminating powers of the sun work in a different way in the air than they do in water. I notice that the jaw of the bird is forced back into its bodily substance. I become aware that it is as if all of the flesh that would have surrounded and supported the teeth were forced backward and the jaw pressed forward and became hardened in its form. I discover why the bird thrusts its beak forward, whereas the fish, in a softer way, supports its jaw within the bodily substance. The head of the bird is a creation of the air, and yet the air too is affected by the inwardly glowing, illuminating presence of the sun. I recognise what a great difference there is between the sunlit and sun-warmed water that creates the form of the fish and the sunlit and sun-warmed air that shapes the form of the bird. I begin to understand that because of the specific configuration of the elements in which the bird lives, it receives its unique form. Just as the fins of the fish receive their ray-like form through the element of water, so too the bird's feathers look a certain way, depending on how they are ruffled by the air and affected by the light and warmth of the sun. In this way I can go beyond a simple, naive act of looking at something 
and instead I can strive for a living comprehension of a creature within nature. I can exert myself rather than being lazy. If I see a fish lying on a table, I can, at the same time, picture it moving within water. If I see a bird in its cage, I can immediately visualise the air surrounding it in flight. I do not have to watch a bird flying in the air in order to feel and perceive the powerful, formative force of the air upon the very form of the bird itself. In this way, what lies in the form of the bird is enlivened and spiritualised within me. That is, I can experience and perceive the forms of the fish and the bird inwardly. They become enlivened and spiritualised within me. Likewise, I can perceive in a living way the difference between a thick-skinned animal like the hippopotamus and a thinner-skinned animal such as a pig. I can see that the thick-skinned hippopotamus is attracted to direct contact with sunlight, whereas the thin-skinned pig prefers to withdraw from sunlight. To put it briefly, I learn to behold the many ways in which nature rules and manifests in each individual created being. I would like to move now from examples in the animal kingdom and speak about what we call the elements in our physical world. I shall not take the path of the chemist who says that water consists of two atoms of oxygen and one of hydrogen. I shall put aside the scientist's observation that the air contains oxygen and nitrogen. I prefer to go directly to concrete observation. I see a body of water filled with fish and the relationship between water and fish. It is merely an abstraction to say that water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen, for that ignores a great deal. The reality is that water together with the sun and the moon create a fish, and furthermore the fish speaks to my soul about the elemental nature of water. It is just an abstraction when I describe air as a mixture of oxygen and nitrogen, for the sunlit and sun-warmed air presses the flesh back over the bird's beak and shapes the breathing organisms of both fish and bird into very different forms. The elements speak to me through the fish and the bird as they each reveal to me their unique characteristics. Think about how natural phenomena became inwardly richer with this approach and how everything is inwardly impoverished when we speak about nature from only a materialistic point of view. I would like you to take note that what arises out of anthroposophic spiritual science will provide many opportunities to change attitudes toward conventional modes of thinking as the examples I've just described indicate. For what we will bring forward through anthroposophic spiritual science will not be the same as the products of our present civilization. Rather, what we have to offer will be a stimulus to develop a fuller understanding of the world. If people began to inwardly experience the changes in the conventional attitudes that I've tried to characterize, then a new consensus would enable them to form a community, such as our anthroposophical society, which is truly based upon reality. Then everyone who belonged to the anthroposophical society, for example, would be able to say, I am a person who feels grateful to the elemental beings who once worked actively in my being and have made me who I am today. In former times, they dwelt within my physical body and spoke to me through my very organs. The elemental beings have lost this capacity to speak to me through my organs. However, if I am able to observe everything in the world in the manner just described and to recognise that phenomena are formed out of nature in its totality, if I take seriously the characterizations given to me through anthroposophy, then I will be able to speak out of my soul in a language that elemental beings once again can understand. I wish to become a human being who expresses gratitude to these spiritual beings. I want to emphasize that in the anthroposophical society, it is not enough to say that here we speak about the spirit. The pantheist also says that. In the anthroposophical society, we must consciously live with the spirit. If we are able to do this, then quite naturally we should be able to live in the spirit with other human beings as well. Furthermore, it be recognised that the anthroposophical society is carrying the responsibility to repay the nurturing elemental beings for what they have done for us in former times. We also would be aware of the reality of the reigning spirit that is present in the anthroposophical society. Much of the old feeling that still lives as traditions among us would disappear 
and a real feeling would develop for the unique task of the Anthroposophical Society in our present day. Everything else would gradually be understood in its true meaning and value. We may say with a certain inner satisfaction that the Gertianum, which now has been brought to a tragic end, was built through the cooperation and labour of 17 nationalities, even though it was constructed at the same time that the peoples of Europe were waging war against one another. But the Anthroposophical Society will become a reality only when people strip away what they cling to in the narrow confines of nationality. Then anthroposophic cohesiveness can become a reality and it will become something more than an abstract striving expressed in the founding of the Anthroposophical Society. In order to accomplish this, however, very specific preparations are necessary. To a certain degree, the reproach coming from the outside world regarding anthroposophists is justified. The anthroposophic movement talks a great deal about making spiritual progress, but in fact we see very little evidence of spiritual progress in the lives of individual anthroposophists. Progress certainly is possible. A careful reading of specific books opens the possibility of true progress in relationship to the spiritual. But in order for this to take place, the matters we spoke about yesterday must be taken seriously, must become real. We need to recognise that the physical body will become properly constituted through truthfulness. The etheric body will be realised through beauty and the astral body will be refined through the sense for the good. Speaking of truthfulness, I wish to point out that all who wish to unite themselves within the anthroposophical society must prepare themselves by cultivating truthfulness. Truthfulness must be acquired in life experience and that will be something different for those who wish to express gratitude to the elemental spirits in nature who have nurtured humanity since ancient times, then it would be for those human beings who know nothing about elemental beings and do not wish to know anything about our indebtedness to them. Those who do not wish to know anything about a deeper perception of reality prefer to present phenomena and events according to their personal prejudices. They would like to say this or that has occurred, if and when it seems right to them. They like to say that this or that person has particular qualities, but only when it corresponds to their own preference. But if you wish to discipline your inner truthfulness, you must not go beyond what speaks to you out of the reality and actuality of the outer world. You must be strict with yourself, remain watchful of your thought processes, be precise in the formulation of your words, so that with regard to the outer world, you articulate nothing other than a veritable fact or state of being. Just think how common or fashionable it is in today's world for people to assert that what appeals to them or whatever has been suggested to them is precisely true. Anthroposophists must not become accustomed to this approach rather they must strictly exclude their own prejudices from the actual facts of a matter and describe only the pure phenomenon or event. Then anthroposophists through their own efforts would become a kind of corrective in society which would challenge the prevailing confusion between what is opinion and what is fact. Think of what is typically reported in newspapers today. Newscasters and journalists feel obligated to report everything whether or not it has been verified and then say that it actually is thus and so. We often suspect that when we are told something the person speaking has not taken the trouble to find out if the facts of the matter have been verified. Often an account is justified by saying, well that certainly could have happened. Regarding the world around us, we often hear that this or that is presumed to be so. Why shouldn't this actually have occurred in this way? But with this approach we can never achieve a sense of inner truthfulness. When we, as anthroposophists, educate ourselves in the observation of the outer world of the senses, we must stand strictly behind what is verifiable and what corresponds exactly to what appears before our eyes in the world of the senses. If such a goal were embraced in our world today, it would cause a remarkable change in our society. If a miracle like that occurred and people actually had to make certain that their words corresponded to the facts, this would produce utter silence. 
Unfortunately, much of what he's talked about today has not been verified. Rather, it is filled with all kinds of opinion as it is infused with apathy and indifference for what is real. We also must be aware of what happens to us when we do not strive for complete and utter truthfulness in our lives. If we add anything to what we actually perceive through our outer senses, if we convey anything that does not correspond to the pure and accurate course of events or phenomena we observe, and if we allow these to enter our ideas and confide them in our representations to other people, our capacity to acquire higher knowledge will be extinguished. There was once an occasion in a college of law in which a carefully planned scene was enacted in front of about 20 law students. The students who had observed the interaction were asked to write down what they had witnessed. The scene had been carefully planned ahead of time to the smallest detail and so it was possible to know how the event unfolded. Among the 20 students who wrote down what they had seen, three of them wrote accounts that were about half correct and 17 wrote descriptions that were inaccurate. And so in a classroom of law students, only three out of 20 students were able to observe accurately a brief scene. If we were to pick randomly any 20 people who observed an event and afterward listen to one after the other of the witnesses, none of them would come close to an accurate description. I shall put aside situations when a person is in extraordinary circumstances. It does occur under the intense pressure of battle that an evening star glimmering through the clouds has been taken from an enemy plane. That kind of thing can happen in a moment of agitation and in a situation like that the consequences of an error may become greatly magnified. In the small details of everyday life, however, such errors are constantly occurring. We speak about cultivating an anthroposophic way of life and making it a reality. This realisation will depend upon the extent to which we develop an understanding of facts based on the utmost accuracy. You have to educate yourself in order to recognise and master what is factual. If you are able to do this, then you will be able to see the reality behind the outer facts and you will not paint a phantom over the reality when you later wish to describe an event. You only have to read the newspapers today. Supposedly we have swept aside all of the ghosts that might haunt us, but what is reported as certainty in newspapers is actually full of phantoms and ghosts of the worst sort. The accounts people tell each other are likewise filled with illusions. That is the reason why the basis for ascending into higher worlds today is to first acquire an accurate sense for what happens in the world of sense perception. That is the only way you can arrive at truthfulness in the way I described it yesterday. Yesterday I tried to demonstrate how you can develop in a living way a true feeling for beauty. This you can do by observing nature and perceiving how a certain creature was shaped by its physical surroundings. For example, through observation you can see and understand why the bird has a beak and why, looking carefully at a fish, its head is drawn forward in order to protect its delicate soft jaw. Really learning to live in, into these phenomena helps to develop our sense for beauty. Spiritual truth cannot be reached without the element of goodness, without a true sense for the good. The human being must develop the capacity to have a genuine interest in another human being, to feel empathy for someone else and to be willing to make a sacrifice on behalf of another person. Morality begins when your own astral body receives the impress of the lines of worry and concern on another human face. That is the moment when morality begins, otherwise morality is merely the imitation of polite behaviour or custom. What I've described as a moral deed in my book The Philosophy is Free of Freedom is directly connected with experiencing in your own astral body the deep lines of worry and concern on someone else's face, or the lines on the face of a person who is smiling. Unless we immerse our own soul in the soul of another person, and that is inherent to the art of living together as human beings, we cannot develop a life imbued with true spirituality. A strong foundation for developing spirituality will be established if, within the anthroposophical society, 
It were really true that whenever you met someone, you could experience in a living way what the two of you share through anthroposophy, and neither of you would bring into the anthroposophical society today's all too commonly held misguided feelings and prejudices. If the anthroposophical society really were to become a new creation, then above all else, each one would affirm by every other person as an one's equal and as a fellow anthroposophist. Then, indeed, our society would exist as a reality. We would not find cliques being formed within the society. Attempts to encourage antipathy towards someone in particular or toward a group of people would cease, even though situations like this have become all too common outside of our society. The relations between individuals will be based upon experience of the spiritual that flows among us. But in order to begin our self-education, to recognise what is true when we stand before facts and events, we must observe with exactitude and then take full responsibility for giving an accurate account every time we report a fact or describe an event or relate what another person has said. Cultivating truth is our first task. Entering into the reality or experience of every living creature you encounter in nature is the second responsibility. Here we learn to cultivate, for example, our feeling for the importance of water for a fish and the significance of the air for a bird. To these examples we can add the empathy and understanding we extend to our fellow human beings. Third, Cultivating and heightening our sensitivity to the good by experiencing everything that interests another human being and all that is living in the soul of another person. If we were to develop all these capacities as individuals, then the anthroposophical society would become a place where people strive to educate the physical body, etheric body and astral body according to the appropriate goals and nature of each one of these human elements. Then it would be possible to initiate what I have ever and again characterised as necessary when I say that the anthroposophical society should not be a society that merely issues a membership card showing a person's name, affirming membership in a society and indicating the person's number on the membership list. Rather, the anthroposophical society should be permeated by a common spirituality that can grow stronger and stronger and ultimately will demonstrate that it is more important for a person to feel the anthroposophic spirituality of another human being than it is to know if another person has a Russian, English or German spirituality. Only then will a sense of community and common purpose truly be present in an anthroposophical society. We do not always grasp the significance of the present moment in history but in this modern era we understand that we live within the course and the context of history. We know that now we must take seriously the Christian principle of universal humanity, the principle of a shared community across humanity. For without this the earth will not fulfil its purpose and meaning. We can assume that at one time elemental spiritual beings existed who cherished and fostered humanity and whose existence we should recall with gratitude. In recent centuries, in the so-called civilised world of Europe and the Americas, human beings have lost their connection to these elemental beings. Humanity once again must learn to regard the spiritual world with gratitude. It will be possible for human beings to bring about healthy social relationships on the earth only when we develop a deep gratitude and a strong love for the elemental beings of the spiritual world. These conditions can come about only when we too acknowledge these elemental spiritual beings as something concretely real. Then the feeling of one human being towards another will become completely different and it will resemble again the way that relationships in previous eras were cultivated but which in the last centuries has languished. In recent times one typically experiences another human being as someone alien to oneself and regards one's own self as more important than anything else. And yet we barely know who we are today. We have no answer for the question, what is it within you that you love above all else? We reply that the natural scientist or the physician can explain why we love ourselves most of all. But in terms of our feelings, 
we are quite unconscious and live only within ourselves. But if we continue to live merely within ourselves, we shall manifest exactly the opposite of what a living anthroposophic community is capable of generating on behalf of humanity. We absolutely have to recognise that the human being must come out of the self. We must become as interested in the characteristics and capacities of every other person to the same degree that we are interested in ourselves. If we are unable to do that, an anthroposophical society shall never come into being. The society as an organisation can accept members and exist for a while because the rules for membership have been laid out, but that is not equivalent to a reality. The society will not become a reality because it accepts members and the members are given membership cards that say that they are anthroposophists. Realities do not exist because something has been written down or published. Realities come into being only when they are alive. What we write down or publish has to be an expression of life. When our words arise out of living experience then a reality is present. If what has been recorded or published remains no more than what appears on paper and is simply conventional in its meaning, then it will soon be apparent that what has been written down is only a corpse. As soon as I write something down, it is as if I molt my thoughts. When a bird molts, that is, sheds its feathers, the cast-off feathers are dead. The bird has to grow new feathers. Today, human beings often do no more than shed dead thoughts when they write something down. They are eager to commit every thought into writing. But it would be very difficult for a bird, once it has cast off its old feathers, to turn right around and molt its feathers again. If somebody were to try to restore a canary that has shed its feathers, then they would have to find a way to attach artificial feathers. We have the same situation today with human thoughts in relation to the written word and genuine reality. When people are easily satisfied with writing down malted thoughts and sending dead thinking to the publishers, we are inundated with artificial realities that have nothing to do with true realities. Unfortunately, for the most part, we are producing artificial realities. It is disappointing when we cannot see what true reality is, when we do not notice that we rarely hear the voice of a true human being. We rarely have anything to say out of our true universal humanity. Instead of speaking out of the core of our com common humanity, we speak as individuals and only out of one or another role we assume in our outer lives, such as a government representative or as a lawyer. But these roles are merely abstract categories. Today it is no longer important to know that it is a woman or a Dutchman or a Russian who is speaking. We must begin to look beyond the fact that a cabinet member or government official or Russian, German, Frenchman or Englishman is speaking. We must be aware only that a true human being is speaking. In order to do that, we ourselves as human beings must be fully aware and completely present. We shall never fulfil our true humanity, however, if we are concerned only with self-knowledge. For in our era, the individual self must be linked to a common universal humanity. This is the only relevant reality for human beings. Look at the truth of our reality. We know that we cannot live by breathing in air that we have already taken into our own bodies. Likewise, we cannot live as human beings solely by what exists within our own selves, by feeling just what arises in our own souls. Try to breathe in the air that you breathe out. You cannot do it. Similarly, you cannot live as a real human being by living entirely out of your own inner self. We can live as human beings only by living in our social life, by living in association with others. We must experience who other human beings really are and what they to experience with their fellow human beings. We can live within the experience of another human being only when we ourselves can sense what fills the other human being, what we ourselves can feel when another person is feeling within. That is true human community. That is being truly human in your own life and within the life of humanity. 
Wanting to live only within what one creates in one's own self would mean that one would prefer not to breathe in the air around, but would rather breathe into a container of one's own breath. Then you would soon die, because the physical reality is less merciful than the spiritual. But if you continuously were to breathe only the air around yourself, if you wished to live only within your own experience, then you would die. It is just that we do not realise that we have died within our souls, or at least spiritually. Above all, we must realise that the real founding of the anthroposophical society and the anthroposophic movement will be accomplished only when we take to heart the words we hear when the shepherd Huckle in the Christmas play admonishes his sleepy companion. Buckle, wake up! I have pointed out that adopting the anthroposophic life should awaken you. This life should be an awakening. At the same time, it also must be an ongoing avoidance of the death of one's soul and a continuing call to liveliness in the life of the soul. In this way, the anthroposophical society will, in and of itself, generate the inner strength necessary to make it a reality.